Uh, good morning. As uh, Chuck mentioned, I'm Dave Miller. I'm a supervisory special agent, very special agent with the FBI's Baltimore office just up the road. Um, and it is a great honor for me to introduce uh, today Executive Assistant Director Richard A. McFeely. Um, Mr. McFeely is the Executive Assistant Director of the FBI's Criminal, Cyber, and Crisis Response Services Branch. Um, he was appointed to this position back in July and from what I can gather, he's been a very busy man since he got to headquarters. He is responsible for all FBI criminal and cyber investigations worldwide, as well as international operations and critical incident response. Mr. McFeely entered on duty with the FBI as a special agent in February 1990. He was assigned to the Buffalo Division, and he worked uh, primarily violent crime matters. Um, he was the lead case agent in the Oklahoma City bombing back in 1995, and a few years later, I uh, was promoted to supervisor at FBI headquarters in the Criminal Investigative Division. During his stint at headquarters, he oversaw the FBI's drug investigations, and about a year after arriving there, he was detailed to the Executive Office of the President, Office of National Drug Control Policy, where he helped formulate national policy on uh, the nation's counter-narcotics efforts. He transferred to the Washington Field Office in 1999, and following the 9-11 attack on the Pentagon, he was the FBI's on-scene commander. He supervised the counterterrorism squad after that and was instrumental in setting up a joint intelligence center in Fairfax, Virginia, with state and local police as well as the, as well as the FBI and other agencies to promote and increase information sharing amongst the federal, state, local governments. He received the FBI Director's Award in 2005 for Outstanding Counterterrorism Investigation for supervising a multinational investigation into the assassination plot against a foreign head of state. He later became an Assistant Special Agent in charge of the technical programs for the FBI. In 2006, he returned to FBI headquarters as a Section Chief and became the FBI's Budget Officer and was later the Deputy Chief Financial Officer for the entire FBI oversaw the entire budget, acquisition, and accounting functions. Then he moved to Baltimore, where he was the special agent in charge uh, for the last three years until he came back to, to FBI headquarters in his current role. Um, I had uh, a great opportunity to work with Rick for the last few years. He is a, one of the best agents I've ever worked with or worked for, and it is my distinct honor today to introduce Executive Assistant Director Richard A. McFeely. Uh, good morning. For some time uh, now, my wife's been working on a mini EMP device to try to get our kids to talk to us again. Uh, but I do want to thank you for the opportunity to come and, uh, to talk with you about how the FBI and the private sector are working together to protect this critical infrastructure, uh, infrastructure uh, particularly from the cyber threat. I was asked to speak specifically about how InfraGuard uh, fits into the role of protecting infrastructure uh, security across the private sector. But I want to relate this to how we're looking to get the major stakeholders uh, uh, in our critical infrastructure incorporated into the InfraGuard model. I recognize that not everybody here today is an InfraGuard member. I hope uh, after today you go back, if you represent a company, uh, if you represent uh, somebody in the uh, critical infrastructure world that you rethink whether or not the InfraGuard model is something that you want to uh, uh, participate in. And I'm going to give you a lot of reasons today why. The, uh, there's been major transformation going on right now within the FBI. And as I, uh, you hear me speak today, I'm going to announce some things that really uh, have been in concept now over the past six months, um, but they're going to radically transform uh, the FBI's relationship uh, with the private sector, and InfraGuard itself is going to be the key component behind all of that. The challenge uh, that I have seen over the years is how to make InfraGuard relevant to its members and a value-added resource to your company. I'm not sure, in all honesty, that the FBI has really lived up to those tenets. Uh, those, that situation right now is changing at lightning speed, and I want to talk about those changes, but briefly talk about uh, the importance of it in context of the current threat. 
The threat to the North American power grid has been studied internally within the U.S. government, by industry, uh, by the private sector, uh, academia, and think tanks. There is a general consensus that the grid is very vulnerable to multiple physical and or cyber attacks that would result in significant and sustained loss of power. Uh, us in the FBI are very concerned that these vulnerabilities uh, uh, exist, uh, especially when it comes to attacks against SCADA systems, uh, our dependence upon uh, GPS, and the disruption of transmission lines. The subject of EMP attacks needs to be studied more and the threat needs to be taken very seriously. But I want to confine my remarks today towards attacks against this critical infrastructure from a cyber perspective, and which to many experts represents a higher, prob a higher probability risk. One of the significant reasons behind such an assessment, as we all know, is that cyber attacks can be conducted remotely, cheaply, and with off-the-shelf products available for sale on the Internet. We see that every day. I know this audience is all too familiar with the nature of the cyber threat, so I won't take our time by describing it in detail. But my reference to changing the FBI's engagement with the private sector is specifically because of the current threat environment. It's no secret that over the past few months that uh, key segments of our financial sector have been under cyber attack. The implications of taking down these key segments of our financial infrastructure are obvious. Suffice it to say, when you look across the world as a whole, uh, we are losing data, money, ideas, and innovation to our many cyber adversaries. And our critical infrastructure is vulnerable to attack uh, by those who wish to do us harm. We are a wired world, and there is no turning back from that. FBI Director Robert Mueller has openly stated over the past few months what most U.S. government professionals believe. That is, that he expects the cyber threat to surpass the terrorism threat to our nation. So what's the FBI doing about that? We recognized the significance of the cyber threat several years ago, more than a decade ago. We created a cyber division. We have elevated the cyber threat as our number three national priority behind counterterrorism and behind our responsibility for counterintelligence. We have significantly increased our hiring of technically trained agents, analysts, and forensic specialists. And we have expanded our partnerships with law enforcement, private industry, and academia, and through initiatives like InfraGuard. By far, the creation of the InfraGuard program in the mid-1990s represents the premier example of private-public uh, partnerships. Since then, we have seen this initiative grow from a great idea in one field office in the Midwest to more than 53,000 members in 86 chapters across the United States. On behalf of the FBI, I want to thank all of you who, who do participate in InfraGuard and who put a lot of effort, like today's uh, uh, conference, uh, into the, this endeavor. And I want to thank you for your continued support as we build on this partnership and take it to new heights. There is virtually no discussion that takes place within our halls when it comes to the cyber threat and uh, private engagement that doesn't bring up the role of InfraGuard. Our plan is to build much of our planned capabilities into the InfraGuard structure, and I, in a moment I will take, talk more about those capabilities. While we have made significant progress against the cyber threat in recent years, it continues to evolve and expand. What you may not be aware of is that in many instances, we have insight and advance notice that adversaries are going to launch an attack. Over the past year, under our legal authorities, and in conjunction with our gov government partners, we have had a fair amount of success in warning companies ahead of time that they're about to be the uh, victims of a computer network ex uh, exploitation or an attack. And they were able to use that information to shore up their defenses. We want to be able to do more of that. 
We need to prevent attacks before they occur, and that is why we and the FBI are redoubling our efforts to strengthen our cyber capabilities in the same way we strengthened our intelligence and national security capabilities in the wake of the attacks in 2001. We call it our next generation cyber initiative, and it entails a wide range of initiatives, from focusing our cyber division now strictly on intrusions, to hiring additional computer scientists across the country, and in expanding our partnerships and collaboration at the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force, the NCIJTF, which I'll speak to in a moment. But part of our next-gen cyber that's most relevant to you is our plan to significantly expand our, our, expand our partnership with the private sector. In the past, industry has provided us information about attacks that have occurred, and we have come in in a reactive mode and investigated them. Our adversaries have taken advantage of the fact that we have been limited in the kind of information we have exchanged with the private sector. But we all now realize that we can no longer keep this a one-way communication. We, we are going to give you tools, including information, to help to repel these intruders. In fact, just two weeks ago, for the first time, the FBI started to hold classified threat briefings to the major Internet service providers to educate them and work with them to exchange information. That is now uh, part of a cycle that every week we are bringing in major uh, ISPs and our backbone telecommunications providers and actually briefing them on the same material that we're seeing that's emanating against our critical infrastructures. And I want to tell you about some additional specifics of how we intend to engage with the private sector. We are developing a malware repository and analysis tool. We call it BACS, the Binary Analysis Characterization and Storage System, to help us identify our cyber adversaries and prevent attacks. If you've been hacked, you can send the malware into our system and get a report back on whether other companies have had similar attacks. If there is a match, the, the FBI would make contact with those companies to see if they wouldn't mind sharing that information with you. We want to do that with the FBI as an intermediary so there is no concern with privacy issues. We plan to make BACS the nation's repository for malware and viruses much the same way that we do it with fingerprints, with DNA, and criminal arrest records for U.S. law enforcement agencies and our foreign port partners. We are also going to provide an electronic means for you to report intrusions real time. Right now, uh, to report an intrusion to the FBI, it's basically uh, based on whether the company has a contact within the FBI or uh, somebody in the company picking up the phone and calling the local FBI field office. That is not a good way to do business. We can't treat this as an ad hoc responsibility. The system that we are developing, which will be deployed sometime uh, over the next few months, is called iGuardian. And it's modeled after the Guardian system that we've used very successfully for the past 10 years for law enforcement to report terrorism leads to us. It has, it's based off the same platform that we use to track these terrorism leads, and it, as I said, is a highly successful effort uh, on the CT side, the counterterrorism side, that we believe now can be rolled out to the private sector and provide an online platform to report intrusions to us. We also want to ensure that if you do provide us of, uh, information, that we're going to keep it safe. We're currently in the process of vetting a, a template for non-disclosure agreements through our Office of General Counsel. We make our living protecting proprietary information. But we want to be able to put it in writing to, to assure you that the reporting you make to us will be kept safe from outside disclosure absent extraordinary circumstances. We recognize that you have to have that degree of comfort from us before you're willing to report the intrusions. Through InfraGuard, we're, developing an, uh, we're doing better on exchanging information at a higher level about what we are seeing. 
But it's hard to stand up here and deliver the same message to retailers, to defense contractors, and to ener energy companies. The threat to each of these sectors is not always the same. To provide a more targeted threat picture and a more meaningful dialogue, we are propo proposing to create sector chiefs within InfraGuard. These sectors are going to be divided up along DHS's 18 critical infrastructures. And these individuals would serve as points of contact for investigations and issues related to their sectors. They would serve as an expert resource for FBI field office and other InfraGuard members. And they would facilitate in intelligence dissemination within their sectors. Concentrating on specific individual sectors allows us to develop a more focused picture as to who wants what from your networks. A country with a, meek, a weak military, for example, is likely after technology designs, where the motive of those with a more developed economy is more likely using espionage to uh, develop ways to defeat our advanced technology. We want to make sure that we have the private sector as well as U.S. government partners poised to handle that threat. We're also expanding our cyber training for the private sector. Early next year, we're launching the first session of our National Cyber Executive Institute. This is a three-day seminar to, treat, to train leading industry executives on cyber threat awareness and information sharing. Held in Quantico, our first few classes will be targeting those InfraGuard sector chiefs that I just mentioned. The, uh, during this three-day seminar, you will hear from various U.S. government agencies who we work with very closely, and we'll walk through real-life scenarios to help us both develop ways to better defeat the threat. So what can the private sector do as part of this process? Number one, report intrusions. It is critical that when your network is breached, you report the intrusion to us. I'm continually amazed every day at the number of intrusions that we're aware of based on our authorities to collect intelligence uh, with our partners uh, that we have knowledge of, that we know the companies know about, but the companies never come forward to us. And we go out and we make victim notifications to those companies. Uh, and like I say, many times they are aware that they've been hacked, but they've taken no steps to report that intrusion uh, to us or to end, or the DHS or anybody else that has an interest in, uh, in uh, the cyber intrusion world. We recognize that you may be hesitant to disclose the breach out of concern that the word is going to leak out to the public or to the shareholders, and, but it's important that you recognize that you need to be part of this solution. We can work together to resolve the type of exploitation or attack you are undergoing. And as I mentioned, we are working on ways to ensure the confidentiality of our relationship. Number two, join in for guard. If your company is not already a member of InfraGuard, please look into it and decide whether or not your company belongs and what the value added will be for, for you, especially those of you that are involved in the critical infrastructure sec sectors. Number three, work to expand your existing chapter. If you're a member of InfraGuard, we want to work with you to organize your chapter into those sectors that I talked about. This is a new concept for InfraGuard. We have, over the past 10 years, basically delivered a un a one unified message to all the InfraGuard members. As I explained, that's not a good model. Each of you that comes from different sectors has different issues, has different threats. The adversaries are uh, interested in specific uh, in uh, types of information, and it's not necessarily a unified message. By breaking us up into sectors, we feel that we're going to be able to deliver a much more narrowly focused threat briefing to you and work with you to understand uh, the issues that you might be having. We need your help in bringing new industry partners. The great thing about InfraGuard is, is these things uh, like BAX and iGuardian that I spoke about, they're going to be available through the InfraGuard portals. In other words, we're going to be using InfraGuard as the hub to transmit that information directly into the local FBI field office. 
You need to be full partners with us through the good and the bad. If you think that the FBI or the U.S. government has a full, uh, full on solutions to these threats, you're mistaken. We learn as much from you as you learn from us. Uh, oftentimes, you in the private sector uh, are seeing the threats before we're seeing them. We have to make sure that we're linked up. The only people that are winning right now are the bad guys. As uh, in all of our work, these partnerships are critical to our success. But it's particularly true in the cyber realm because of the constantly evolving nature of technology. The bottom line is we need you. You are a critical part of the fight against the cyber threat. But we've got to energize this partnership by increasing the information flow back and forth. And by giving you a secure means to report your intrusions, an opportunity to have your malware analyzed in this repository, and other tools and information. But we believe through these things, these are great first steps in engaging the private sector. I want to thank you again for inviting me to be here today. Before he, leaves us, before he leaves the stage, I'm going to have Special Agent Lauren Schuller ask a directed question. And uh, before she does, I was just reminded, um, you know, in the EMP SIG, we're also organizing private sector leaders and in various infrastructures and, and subject matter experts to, uh, or expertise to become advisors to us on the national basis. And uh, we have a number of people today who have agreed to do that, uh, many of whom are speaking today, you know, folks in subject matter areas such as Dr. Baker. Congressman Bartlett's uh, ag agreed to do that on the policy side. There are a number of others who will serve as national experts that could be available to local chapters. And so I think that would be a great parallel to the work that you're doing with all of these critical infrastructures as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is have Lauren ask uh, the first question, and then I think we'll have time for one or two questions more. And Lauren, why don't you begin with, with the first question? Good morning. Can you hear me okay here? I'm um, Special Agent Lauren Schuler. I'm the InfraGuard Coordinator in the Baltimore Field Division. Thank you, Mr. McFeely, for being here today and providing these great remarks and for your support of InfraGuard. I, um, I know you've provided a lot of information this morning on what the FBI is doing to work with the private sector to prevent attacks on our infrastructures. I wondered if you could just take a minute and clarify the FBI's role um, with the private sector in the event of an actual attack on our power grid or to our cyber infrastructure or to one of the 18 um, infrastructures that we've been discussing this morning. One of the, um, having been a veteran of the huge reorgani reorganization of the United States government after the attacks in 2001, uh, there was a lot of chaos, as everybody knows. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security was created. Uh, it, it consolidated dozens and dozens of agencies. There was a scramble, of course, to figure out who uh, the terrorists were that conducted it, what was the extent of their networks. Uh, and there was a lot of back and forth between uh, government agencies as to who was responsible for what. Uh, I'm happy to say that one of the best things that's going on now at the highest levels of, these, of this government is the discussions among the interagency uh, organizations that have a role in the cyber, uh, in the cyber uh, threat that there is great cooperation. There isn't anything that the FBI is not involved in that doesn't involve our fellow intelligence community partners uh, and with the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, this is not a situation uh, that existed right uh, post-2001 where everybody was kind of left to fend for themselves and to find their lanes in the road. The lanes in the road as the threats come in are being discussed jointly and with a whole scale agreement as to who's responsible for what. Obviously the scenario you just described is the worst case scenario. Uh, we have a situation where something has already happened. Uh, much of the effort right now in the U.S. government is to try to prevent uh, any such attack. The impact, obviously, of uh, uh, post-attack is going to involve a whole host of agencies. From the FBI's perspective, it's obviously going to be the who and the why. 
We'll get to the who based on the how. In other words, if uh, the network or if the infrastructure uh, electric grid was brought down uh, by a uh, malware attack or something like that, it's going to be through cyber investigation uh, between us and our national security partners to try to, tra to trace it back to who's behind the keyboard. Uh, we spend an awful lot of resources and, and, and efforts doing that now. Uh, but it's not just a uh, intelligence community or law enforcement response. The consequence management behind this is, um, is well in the lane of the Department of Homeland Security, who I think is well postured at this point to handle uh, getting the networks back online uh, to uh, mitigating any potential uh, future damage. So it was really going to be a holistic government response. Uh, and uh, like I say, this is one of these areas where there's not infighting within U U.S. government. Uh, these types of uh, scenarios are uh, talked about every week in the interagency. The NCI-JTF that I spoke about earlier is 19 agencies uh, that have come together. It's run by the FBI, but the deputy directors are deputy directors from NSA, from CIA, from the Department of Homeland Security. And we exist... Um, really to have a not just an operational response but at the policy level to talk about the what ifs and uh, that's an example of the kind of holistic government approach that we would we would bring to bear okay i uh, i see a couple of hands peter's close to the front oh congressman bartlett he's in the front row he gets a first shot uh, he, he'd like to have a question uh, thank you very much if in fact the grid is down, really down for a prolonged period of time, which any one of these five things could, could produce. How much functional government really remains? Well, I, I hate to stand up here and kind of give a, the after action report um, or the bomb damage assessment to, uh, to our adversaries. Obviously, it's a huge concern. And uh, we would rely within the FBI on our um, uh, probably a, the DOD uh, elements uh, to help us. Uh, obviously, FBI agents uh, are going to experience the same sort of uh, issues that private citizens are going to experience. They have families. Uh, they're going to need to feed their families. Uh, we are going to have to maintain essential government services, and it's going to be a very difficult road to hoe. Uh, but there are those discussions going on right now. Um, I'm relatively confident um, the communications uh, can be quickly restored among government agencies, but there's obviously overriding concerns on, uh, on you know, multiple levels. So uh, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I think it's one of these issues that need to be studied more carefully. Uh, one, I think we have time for two quick mo ones left. Peter? I'll make it very quick. I don't actually have a question, but a point of information. Uh, on the issue of EMP versus cyber, uh, the Congressional EMP Commission found that when you look at the military doctrines of our foreign adversaries, Iran, North Korea, Russia, China, they define cyber warfare differently than we do. They include EMP, nuclear EMP, EMP from radio frequency weapons, as well as computer viruses. If they go after our critical infrastructures, it's not going to be one of these things. They're going to throw in the kitchen sink, in a, especially in a, in a, in a war. And uh, Cindy Ayers from the U.S. Army War College is here, but the U.S. Army War College made a recommendation to Cyber Command that we need to adjust our military cyber doctrine to reflect this reality. Thank you very much, Peter. And one more question. Thank you. Yeah. Good day, sir. I have a question <clears throat> about how the cyber... Uh, uh, archive of incidents, whether you're getting feeds from, say, Verizon, uh, cyber incident listing, SEI cert, uh, U.S. cert, overseas um, archives of, 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 of cyber incidents. Because right now I'm not seeing that. How, how are we addressing that? Uh, you mean whether the FBI is hooked up at that level? Affirmative. So I can tell you that we are lockstep in with DHS and through their certs. Uh, the assistant director uh, for our cyber division uh, has uh, multiple contacts with the uh, DHS entities responsible for running the certs. 
uh, not only uh, domestically but overseas also. Uh, there are dozens of uh, certs uh, also overseas and uh, there's relationships between the FBI and all of them. The information flow between the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security is at an astounding level of effort and uh, we're not dealing with any issues right now on exchanging such information. The, uh, the lanes in the road, uh, like I say, are fairly well defined. DHS's role is uh, firmly in the prevention, uh, mitigation, and recovery end. And we recognize that, that is a key piece to any consequence management. And uh, the FBI's role is obviously the investigative role, but we also have a prevention piece uh, that as we're finding malware or finding uh, intent of actors to actually attack uh, networks that we've got to get that information very timely to DHS so they can do what they do and disseminate the information out to the private sector. That's happening every day in multiple, multiple instances. I can assure you that we are a lockstep in as a U.S. government between the Department of Justice and Homeland Security. Thank you very much. Um, these are truly substantial and transformative changes that he's announcing to us for the first time. We're very appreciative of the fact that you would do that, especially for us in this audience. We're honored to, to have that. Thank you very much. Um,